what are some things that would slow down a person's ability to, you know, to pull oxalate aside from obviously eating, you know, keeping a high amount in their diet, but are there micronutrient deficiencies? Are there um, certain medications? Are there any other like environmental factors that you would say, if this is also happening, then their progress is going to slow down and not be quite as um, linear, linear, linearly effective? Well, we have to sort of define progress and what's the end point, because we imagine that the end point is emptying the body out of all the crystals. And I don't think that's the end point, because I don't think you can get there. What, what you want is to retain high function and get your metabolism healthy and not have autoimmune diseases and not have your capillaries melting down and retain your vision. So you want functional improvements and you want to slow the aging process. And that's going to happen anyway, if you, if you stay alert to your oxalate exposure. So what is the end game really? The, that's, we have to think about what we're trying to achieve and not necessarily try to push the clearing process because the clearing process is toxic. So you're almost better off allowing some degree of sequestration to re remain and take its time in order to keep the whole system happier and healthier and not create cancer or not create, you know, serious autoimmune problems. So we want to, Slowing is actually a benefit. And what we see that supports the oxalate clearing is calcium, minerals, B vitamins, that will all kind of promote and even uh, adding carbs to a keto diet. The, getting enough energy, you get the energy by giving enough B vitamins, the binders. Calcium is the main binder that helps your body relieve uh, oxalate from the body, but it also calcium is the critical ion in cells. Calcium is the messenger molecule that tells the cell what it's doing. The cell organizes its activity using calcium ions. So you don't want to keep messing up your calcium and your potassium <laughs> and having the, the whole danger signal thing going all the time because your cells are spilling potassium and so on. So it's important to know that when you add these important nutrients that you need to keep your mitochondria working and your metabolism up, the B vitamins, especially thiamine, and all the trace minerals, and then the macro minerals like potassium, calcium, and magnesium, super critical. You could be promoting this clearing process. And, and when you're doing that, you may need to think about, well, let's not have such a low oxalate diet that's causing overdoing the clearing. So if you get really bad reactions to taking calcium, taking B vitamins, eating well, you may need to be evaluating yourself for oxalate clearing. And then it's easy to medicate that using dosing of oxalate, which I also talk about in the book. And there's a table in the back of the book to give people a bit of a guide to get started on that thinking process. So, so, I mean, where I go with that, cause my, I mean, one of my, one of my specialties in my background is micronutrient deficiencies. And so I, my thought immediately jumps to like, okay, vitamin B6, vitamin B1, very critical biochemically for metabolizing oxalate. Right. Um, what I hear you saying though is don't don't necessarily everyone doesn't necessarily need to mega dose those things to speed the process up. Well, you but probably need them. I mean, I love B one. I think B one. You need healthy mitochondria. You need nutrients. <laughs> so, but I think one reason why carnivores delay in the clearing is because they don't use supplements. Generally, the 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 whole culture of carnivore is just eat meat and don't use supplements. And I think not using supplements can help you delay. It's, it's a theory, you know, we don't get to have a lot of research on this. This is all new behavior. The idea of oxalate controlling it in your diet is new. The idea of a carnivore diet is new and research attention on these issues is practically nothing. I, I, I go back to just traditional wisdom, you know, yeah, logic. <laughs> there, there's a reason why these plants are available at certain times of the year and not available at other times of the year. That reason is going to escape us all, at least the, we, we may have theories and we have nuanced ideas about, you know, why that happens, but ultimately we're here and there's a higher power in charge of all this and probably a much greater wisdom and control. And so it was designed that way. And we've just kind of over, you know, overstepped that design to make things more convenient. And I think people are paying a convenience tax, right? I mean, it's ultimately, you know, and if we, if we kind of gravitate back to to balancing things, because it, you know, as you said, it's not, you know, Gone carnivore might not be the absolute end all be all answer for oxalate toxicity because of the reasons you've already laid out, but but reducing your quantity and 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 having balance, you know, so that your body can 
take care of its own business sounds like a good strategy to me. I mean, just on the surface, even without all the research. Well, I love that you talk about the convenience tax. I think that's a great thing for people to get their heads around because we're really kind of selling our souls to the devil of convenience and the idea of being humble in the face of the way nature works. And it, it's on both sides. It's on our lifestyle and what we should expect to be consuming and have access to. There's a lot of entitlement, like I should have spinach every day. I need this or else I'll die. You know, these attitudes make zero sense from a sort of ecological perspective of where what our niche is on the planet and how the planet works and what seasons are. And you know, we're a spinning ball in space that has seasons. Like we've been raised on that environment. We have to live within the con confines of how we've evolved to survive this. And, and this has been part of it, but it also goes on the therapeutic side to be humble in the face of nature. And the oxalate recovery is just a great teacher of this. We pretend we know more than we know. And our hunches and guesses are so culturally bound that we tend to want to over intervene. And my thing is please just work on not poisoning your body first and foremost and treating yourself well and doing things we know are safe like sauna and good sleep. And then obviously we need to replenish these nutrients that we need in, in ways best we can with what tools we have with modern supplements. I think supplements are really important to the recovery and we can over intervene. We think, Oh, I've got to get this out. I need some special magic thing to do this for me. And honestly, the body knows how to do it itself. If it's not poisoned and it's well rested and you have the nutrients you need, even if you're under stress and you're burying your mom and all that, your body will just heal yourself. You know, stress doesn't break down your ability to heal, even though it can prompt clearing and, you know, there's trauma connected to oxalate poisoning, both psychological and physical, and people have traumas really, you know, like, so there's that whole stress side. I'm just sort of mentioning that as an aside, but honestly, if we would be humble enough to just respect the basics of don't poison yourself, be well nourished, take good care of yourself, and then learn from the body and not try to say, wow, well, I got to get this out fast. I got to do this or buy this herb and go do this. And the more you push it, the more sick you're going to make yourself. Yeah, I, I I can see the wisdom in that for sure. Do you do you think that um, you know my my experience? This is just my clinical experience with with certain people, and that is that they're they they have a mold issue environmentally. Um, certain species of mold have been shown to produce oxalates. Of course, mold growing in your house is not the same thing as like aspergillosis in your lungs or something like that, but. Um, there's also some evidence I've seen of even species of candida, for example, being able to generate oxalate. Have, do you have any any kind of insight in that realm um, and things to add? Oh, yeah. I think this is a really important topic because it's getting a lot of play right now. The idea of mold toxicity being a prime generator of chronic inflammatory response syndrome and, and mast cell activation syndrome. In my experience, is it's really oxalate is underneath it all. And just like an autoimmune condition can be a symptom of oxalate poisoning, mold and chronic infections can be a symptom of oxalate poisoning. And yes, molds are a source of oxalate, aspergillus, black mold. Oxalate is the major mycotoxin that it produces. So in your house, you could be breathing oxalic acid in your air. And you know it's hard to say how common true colonization is of aspergillus in the body, because there's not that much of it in the literature. Um, but when it does colonize, it produces oxalate. A lot of it just starts causing stones locally, but obviously it's going to cause some systemic oxalate poisoning to have colonized mold. My experience clinically with my clients is it might take a year or even three years, but a low oxalate diet and they start clearing out all these mold infections that were unresponsive to everything else. And it's clear to them that their mold problems were just secondary to the oxalate toxicity. When it comes to candida, I have not seen convincing evidence from the medical literature that candida directly produces oxalate. Candida clinically seems to be another of these opportunistic overgrowths that happens when your system is stressed, your gut is inflamed, you've got dysbiosis. Generally, oxalate can cause dysbiosis. You have acidity from oxalate and the related inflammation that promotes candida overgrowth. Um, there is a theory out there that the the byproducts of candida metabolism feed bacteria that can make oxalate. So it's possible that the milieu of being 
having this overgrowth of candida is also pro oxalate production, but you don't need all that. You just need dietary oxalate changes to help shift that toxicity situation. It's just like, again, you just lower the toxicity and then the body's ability to finally take care of itself starts coming back online. Yeah. Do you, do you think a lot of people now are talking about um, oxalobacter as a therapeutic, you know, probiotic per se, but, and, and there've been studies that show, you know, low levels or, or declining levels of this particular bacteria in the microbiome. What, what are your thoughts on supplementing with probiotics potentially, you know, I don't, I don't think it's available. I haven't seen it be available oxalobacter at this point, but what are your thoughts there? Well, they've been working on generating a product for 30 or 40 years, and it doesn't work to have a single bacteria. There's a new set of researchers working on an ecosystem product so that multiple different things that are related to oxalate breakdown will be in this product. So different changes in diet and environment, there's more chance of it working and colonizing, but you can't colonize just oxalobacter. They've never figured out how to make that work. A lot of companies have come and gone. People's careers and fortunes have been lost on this one because it just doesn't really work. And I think it's an unfortunate way, an unfortunate priority. It, we really shouldn't be investing all our energy in thinking that gut bacteria will save you from something that absorbs into your blood and your stomach and your upper GI tract. Your stomach is relatively sterile. That is not where formenogenes will be hanging out. So the big problem is that you're putting oxalate and oxalate crystals in your gut and then you're absorbing it into your bloodstream and now you're having to excrete it back into the colon to release it. That's just like kind of like the kidneys are the main exit route for oxalates, but the colon have excretors that will turn on when there's plenty of fermenogies asking for a meal, when there's acidity in the system, when there's obvious uh, kidney stress that, that turns on these transporters in the colon that help remove oxalate from the bloodstream. But that is like secondary to the problem of exposure. That's just giving your body one more exit route that's working well. It doesn't give you carte blanche to live on high oxalate foods. Yeah, that's why I asked the question because I, I, I know... A lot of people's minds go to how can I have my cake and eat it too? And, you know, and that's, that's one of the, probably one of the biggest questions I I've been asked about oxalate specifically is that if I could have this bacteria, could I eat all the oxalate that I want? So thank you for clarifying that. Cause I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Thank you for asking that because that is the kind of like the dog ate my homework kind of, I want to get out of this. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Give me a pill, give me a bacteria to save me. And that's just part of the culture now. For 20 years, we've been focusing on the microbiome as the answer to everything, and therefore blame the microbiome, not the spinach salad. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the microbiome is influenced by the diet and the lifestyle, and the microbiome influences the diet and the lifestyle that we choose. And, you know, in, until we until we escape trying to trick the body and we just go back to earthly fundamentals of, I like to call them the non-negotiables, right? The, the non-negotiable fundamentals of good health, good food, real food, seasonally eaten, organic without chemicals, you know, good sleep, good exercise to tolerance, you know, good sunshine, clean air, clean water, and and love, right? Good, healthy, mental, spiritual health and people around you. Like those things are the stuff of, of health. And, and if we don't have them in our lives or if we have minuscule quantities of those things in our lives and doesn't matter what kind of diet you follow doesn't matter what kind of pill you take you're, you're going to struggle i call that the analog lifestyles like <laughs> <laughs> the analog lifestyle yeah analog like get along with nature again and what we're meant to be doing <laughs> yeah love it love it so what what else could you tell us that is if you think is super important for people to understand around this topic um, that we haven't talked about yet? Well, two big things. One is prevention is so better. As someone who has unfortunately tortured herself with healthy eating and suffered so, so much, honestly, here I am in the 11th year trying to fix my back, which has almost no disc space left in the lumbar spine, has all kinds of issues with stenosis and bone spurs and all of that. I'm going to be wearing glasses forever. Thank you, oxalates. Like prevention is better. Don't wait till you get a kidney stone or wait till you get osteoporosis or wait till your thyroid gland poops out. 
do it now and recognize that your children and the young people in your life deserve that prevention too. And, you know, it's not that hard. We're talking about analyzing your diet, seeing the top five things that are ridiculously high in oxalate and find a few substitutes and you get a world of difference coming back. You've basically found the fountain of youth. It's wonderful. And if you don't want it for yourself, fine, that's your choice, but don't interrupt other people who are attempting to learn low oxalate foods by shaming them because it's not popular. Or it doesn't fit with the plant-based paradigm right now. So it's, it's difficult on people who are pursuing this and are getting well, that they get so little social support. So one of my pleas is to um, allow people to share their story that oxalate's helping them. They've reversed their cataracts, they've reversed their vulvar pain, they've reversed their kidney stones, they can now sleep through the night, they're not getting up to pee all the time, they're happier, they're calmer. You might want to believe them. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say that from my own experience, people don't don't go to the doctor because they they have extra time on their plate and they just want to be gaslighted like they go because they're really sick and we're looking for some real type of answer and unfortunately we just live in a world where real answers are not the priority and real investigation is not the priority so yeah Thank absolutely i just put a big you know sacred thank you on that because people are in trouble right now with their health and they're not getting the solutions they need from the people they trust to give them answers. And it's frightening from a public health standpoint. And it's terrible from a personal standpoint to be that isolated that your doctor mistreats you. Yeah, absolutely. What um, You've got this wonderful book and I encourage all of our watchers to go. And, you know, if, if you're thinking that oxalate might be a part of what you're struggling with and dealing with, you definitely got to go read Toxic Superfoods. Where can people find your research and your, I know you have a website. Um, could you, could you just call that out for everyone? Sure. The website is sallyknorton.com. Sallyknorton.com is the website. And I'm on Instagram as well. I have a YouTube channel called Better with Sally K. Norton. And I'll be putting out more um, stories there, short interviews and videos. So you can reach us through the website. You can come to a group class where you meet other people and I teach. It's a two hour thing on Zoom. There's lots of resources I'm putting out, including a new uh, companion to Toxic Superfoods, which is a data guide that we're arbitrating the data that's out there and presenting it in a more usable way and as complete a tome as we can on the data as well. Love it. I'd love it. Whenever you get that ready, let me know. Cause that's, um, that's always a big question. Like, you know, if I, if I have to stay under 600 or under 500, under 400, but I can't trust the data that's out there, then how am I supposed to navigate this diet? And some people are just very black and white and really need a resource that can, can guide them in a more uh, distinct way, as opposed to guesstimation. So I'm glad that you're putting that together. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sally. I know uh, you're very busy, so I appreciate your time today and appreciate your sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with my with my audience. And um, again, that's sallyknorton.com, correct? sallyknorton.com. That is correct. And I am so grateful to connect with you. Thank you for reading the book and sharing it with your audience. It's just a beautiful thing. Thank you. You're very welcome.